okay. So this is now nearly exactly six months six since lockdown, and it looks like we've got another six months. So let's hope we can get it right this time. Um, yeah, and uh, don't forget everything's on Brian's YouTube channels. Okay, so it's a special, so don't forget to send me your stuff if you want links or slides. Uh, email me on this address, chairrdrf at aol.com. And it's a special car free day special. Although for a lot of us, every day is car free day. So here's the thing that came out from Mums for Lungs. Uh, they have a poster campaign. Last night, 150 volunteers put up over 2,000 posters around schools and nurseries in 30 local authorities across England and Wales, like this, uh, urging people to ditch the car. So if they had 150 volunteers, that's pretty good. Okay, so first bit of news, uh, Chris Boardman had a nice uh, four minute thing about how to live with, with bikes, uh, which was on ITV Cycling on his Twitter feed there. And then guess what happened because he was wearing it like that. Loads of people piled on, so no one, you wearing a helmet, you're supposed to be a role model, blah, blah, blah. So I put in, the good news is, I put on this tweet, good for you, Chris Boardman, cycle helmets are a victim blaming red herring, do carry on the good work. And I asked people to retweet or like, and by Sunday I had 204 likes and 135 retweets. So, you know, there's a, there's a good kind of, uh, anti-helmet backlash thing in there, which is always good to see. And um, uh, it came up on another occasion later this, later this last week. So I mentioned this last week about Superintendent Brighton of West Mercia Police who said they couldn't do Operation Close Pass because it was too dangerous for police officers. That was then reversed. And she said, I've removed an earlier tweet, and this was simply a breakdown in communications. Well, believe that if you will. Um, okay, so the next thing on lids is the dreadful head injury. People headway who are in favor of compulsory lids were given a slot on BBC Crime Watch Roadshow. And they do this thing with a bloody melon, which is a completely stupid way of talking about head injuries. Anyway, uh, they got on Crime Watch and there was a big fuss about that. Uh, Carlton Reed got on there. Uh, he read his article on Forbes and uh, the BBC denied the presenter and endorsed the views of the guests, even though he did. And you can see them doing that on YouTube. And do please complain. You can do you can complain on that link. And there's a background to how you can complain to the BBC there. So get them complaints in. That's the thing you have to do ASAP. And the other thing you have to do before Thursday is respond to the consultation on the comprehensive spending review and Transport Action Network tell you how to do that. Do it as an organization. Don't just copy out stuff from Transport Action Network's uh, list on, of suggestions. Do your own thing, but please do that before Thursday. Uh, just to think about low traffic neighborhoods, a tweet from Mark Philpotts, the ranty highwayman, saying when he's talking about local authorities, it's the constant narrative that cycling is a problem to be solved rather than the solution to problems you haven't bothered thinking about. So I thought that was a nice tweet. Okay, campaigning on LTNs. Do follow tweeters like Danny Williams in London and Paul Gannon. And this particular thing is about a demonstration which I was alerted to by Chris Kenyon. 
here they go. 350 people on a demonstration against low traffic neighborhoods in Islington. That was uh, this last weekend. Uh, memo to the lady there, if you want to tell people how planters are going to kill everybody and nobody's going to be able to live, don't put red writing on a red background. And uh, I, the, here's the 350 of them were, were counted by Chris. Uh, and do note the vehicle. I think uh, I've been told that's a six and a half litre diesel. Uh, what do they call those things with the, uh, with nothing on the back? They have them in, in America a lot. Uh, pickup. No, pickups, pick yes, bloody pickups. Uh, that's uh, rather symbolic, I thought. Uh, now, here's a thing that I just picked up again. This, these stats from uh, Transport for London about the uh, length of car trips in London. You can see 14% under one kilometer, 21% under 1.2, 15 under three, another 10% under four kilometers. And so you can see uh, uh, Norman saying the consequence of not doing anything is just unimaginable. So good point when you're campaigning, when people are talking about how you should have started on the main roads first, or you should have started on other roads start first or somewhere else, just say, bounce it back to them. What are you going to do about it? Okay, now some new statistics. Uh, Jack Mazel's put these up. So, uh, showing, uh, as I did, increasing traffic on urban minor roads. Turns out in London, back streets are carrying, carrying not far off double the traffic they were just 10 years ago. And as he says, where was the consultation on that? Um, and you've seen the graph tweeted by Danny Williams. Driving on residential roads in London has nearly doubled since 2008. And that was when 3G iPhones were first launched. So you've got, here's the vehicle mileage, and then it zooms up uh, because people have all these uh, guides telling them that they could get through quicker if they go on side streets, back streets, and so on. Interesting set of stats there. And uh, on Sunday, the Sunday Times, uh, they spent half the time being arseholes with Jeremy Clarkson and the other fella. And then every now and again, they do something good. And so there was quite a good article on the Waltham Forest, Mini Holland, and talking about how it's been a success. Uh, Wandsworth Tories are out campaigning, saying that the age 24 is terrible and it's all appalling and uh, the Conservatives are campaigning against that. And there's been some stuff about, is this going to be part of the Conservative campaign in London next year? Um, if so, they would be going against national policy. Uh, so will national leadership be able to keep them under control. Uh, now this has happened in Southwark, an interesting bit of vandalism. Uh, there's been a professionally done sign added there. And if you look at it close up, it says road closed to doctors on call, the ambulance service, London Fire Brigade. Now it's been done professionally, and anybody who does this must know that it's illegal to use um, these logos without permission. And of course, the emergency services are automatic consultees on anything like a low traffic neighborhood. So that's been an interesting bit of backlash, sneaky vandalism. Uh, okay, now here we have the insulting analogies section. Uh, first one, uh, this is uh, Northfield's low traffic neighborhood in Ealing. And there's a lady saying, having it put the low traffic neighborhood put in is the same as being in North Korea. And I noticed that because actually in Ealing, the 
actual embassy of the actual North Korea is. So maybe she could pop along there and ask them if uh, Northfields is like uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Korea, whatever it's called. Uh, in Hounslow's dreadful uh, counselor, uh, she looked at that photograph of councillors and Will Norman at the beginning of Cycleway Works and she described it as looking at a photo of a proud and uncowed illegal elephant hunter posing with his trophy. So if you think that's pretty stupid, uh, then yeah, here's another one from Hackney. Some people in London fields are locked in. We cannot come out our own. We cannot come our own borough. Bus gate on both ends. This has seriously restricted our freedom of movement. This isn't the Gaza Strip. So someone said, would you think it was okay if this was in Gaza? And they said, of course not. But I'm sure people in the West Bank, which is different again, will relate to our crisis. Yes, it's the same as being under military occupation, yes. Now the next one, when I mentioned this, uh, maybe it's because I'm Jewish, I did get very upset about it. Some people just thought it was ridiculously funny. I thought it was upsetting. And Mark Strong put in a very dignified response. Um, this was uh, in the Red, Red Record, Red Bridge Record. Uh, Warren Grinberg, who's lived in the area since 77, compared the feeling of being hemmed in to stories his dad, dad would tell him as a Holocaust survivor. And he said, it's all come back to me. I'm terrified of being locked in, using the Holocaust to complain about that. And uh, I regard it as the height of obscenity. He says, when I'm in the car and I see a road closed sign, I feel horrified. It may sound ridiculous to someone in 2020, but that's how I feel as a second generation Holocaust survivor. And that is just so not on, um, you know, my mother was a refugee from Berlin. I don't talk about myself as being second generation Holocaust survivor. And, you know, maybe he's got mental health problems. Maybe he's just got no moral compass. But uh, the Ilford recorder shouldn't have put that in. And it's just offensive and uh whether i mean you know the guy may be uh mentally ill he may have some other problems but of course he probably shouldn't be driving if he's so upset by that and here's from last week i just thought i'd put that thing in about what causes congestion uh it's a repeat of the dft figures uh 36 percent of motorists using increase of motorists using residential streets as cut throughs um, that's the diversity page. What's new on it is here a TFL report which Julia Farini put up against an old one and it says 17% of disabled Londoners use a bike roughly similar to non-disabled. Disabled Londoners less likely to hold any type of driving license, less likely to have access to a car. Um, less likely to be driving and walking is the most commonly used mode of transport for disabled Londoners. Uh, when you say that the black cab guys will say, ah oh, yes, but that's why we have to be able to have easy access everywhere because disabled people can use black cabs. So you have to tell them they can still have access to their homes, they just take a little longer to get there. Okay, here is the delay slide. Uh, nearly six months since lockdown. What's been happening or not happening? And this is the third time for Alex's tweet. Alex's tweets are always good, but we shouldn't have to be saying this again. We still haven't heard about 80% of the government's announced 225 million quid for walking and cycling from May. So when is this going to be happening? I was told last week it would be early September. We've gone past that date. Okay, UK on the ground. It all depends where you live. Bournemouth, we heard about last week. Leicester, 
Uh, Councillor Clark says since schools return, we've introduced 48 traffic management schemes and uh, we're working together with children and families and this has made the big task much easier. That's Leicester stonking along. Birmingham, Bradford Street, oh dear. Um, do look at the tweets from Birmingham cyclist. He's got a good video. Uh, this is all a bit weird. Uh, a very sort of steep crossover there from bus stop and there's a car parked in the cycle lanes. Uh, also from Birmingham, that looks a bit weird there. So not totally happy with that. Edinburgh stuff's gone in on the A702. Any, uh, there's a Twitter thread from Councillor Arthur. Uh, I am dependent on Edinburghians or whatever you call yourselves to let me know about what's happening there. Liverpool, Don Naylor told me today, pop-up lane has been removed in Widness, the Route 3. Uh, he's, I'll just quote him in full because it, it's what I think campaigners need to do. He's saying quality and width is variable, some ones are already missing, some junctions need sorting. Uh, Liverpool City Councillors seem to be holding their nerve. Uh, we need more users, the overall connectivity needs to be improved, but let's support the City Council and the combined authority while also constructively criticising them. Kent, Gar uh, Gary oakram has been reporting on Kent. Uh, nothing, there's a couple of wide lanes in Gravesend, neither particularly long or useful. A town centre's no cycling, most of the roads leading in are pretty crap. Uh, Gravesend LTN had one set of its planters upended and removed within 24 hours. Um, Maidstone's gained a couple of pop-up lanes and the floating bus stops aren't well executed and look like they're going to create conflict zones. I think this is one of the floating bus stops and it doesn't seem to be a floating bus stop. There's no marking there. There's no bus stop there. Can't see the bus stop there. What is it? Anyway, it's a thing in Maidstone and it's not very good. Okay, some stats from London. Uh, this was tweeted. 51% versus 16% want LTNs in their local area. Do quote that. That's a sample of 1,007 Londoners interviewed online between 24th of August and 6th of September. Right, now take a look at these counts. Compared to last September between 9th and 15th, the counts are up 14% on weekdays, 71% up on weekends, 24% up overall. Afternoon weekday peaks have either recovered or exceeding 2019 flows. Now, I would say, well, first of all, don't forget it's a warm September. Uh, public transport is uh, less attractive. On the other hand, there are fewer people working in offices. So on the one hand, we can't expect too much because most people or a lot of people haven't gone back to work. Um, so don't expect too much of uh, an increase in cycling. On the other hand, it's been warm. Buses and tubes don't seem to be attracting people. So we should really, I would say, be up beyond 14% on weekdays and we've had six months so for goodness sake let's try and get some movement going direct support for cycling more cycle lanes etc 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 let's keep it going as soon as possible so that we can uh, keep it going through the winter on the ground in London uh, as reasonable coverage of a BBC uh, item on Ealing, Julian Bell, leader of Lee, uh, uh, London Borough of Ealing. Council's not going to be dropping the plans. We need six months to assess the scheme and give people time to find new routes and switch to cycling and walking. We ask people to be patient and out, to be open-minded. Good for him. Good for you, Councillor Bell. Um, 
On some of the LTNs, bollards and filters are to be replaced by AMPR cameras after vandalism. I think we'll need a session one day on how exactly do we enforce LTNs, how well do they work without cameras. It constantly comes up in each uh, discussion. Haringey, oh dear, uh, complained about putting mini walkers on the cycle lane. And Simon Monk says, in my opinion, wand orcas are best, wands second best, orcas third, mini orcas are chocolate teapot territory. I'd agree with that. Actually, there's a difference between wands and cylinders, but whatever. Uh, and also, uh, a report has been done by Haringey Cycling Campaign and it's referred to by the all party parliamentary group on cycling and walking as a damning report of lack of action on emergency cycle lanes they received the eighth largest settlement in london and with 10 days to the deadline to spend this money virtually nothing has happened to make things safer yes uh haringey did raise some eyebrows when they got that amount of money hackney i mentioned the cat and mountain bridge last week Cameras are not there yet, but according to Brenda Pesh, some car drivers have been law abiding and doing U turns at filters. Uh, Councillor John Burton has done a very good little account of why we have to act. Go to that link, link to see a good example of what a council can and should say about what it's doing. Bromley, oh dear. They've been complaining about the LTN in nearby Croydon, oh, uh, joining Croydon to the minister, directly to the minister. It's not fair. Um, so there's that. Also in London, uh, I don't know if you know Amina, uh, a disabled person uh, talking on her own back. Uh, about the uh, lovely video of Peckham Rye saying, I love that this is motor traffic free, but I would also like to see an accessible shuttle going up and down, maybe one of those mini train bus things you get on tourist places. Um, Camden, pop up dockless bike hire instead of car parking. There you go, dockless bike hire instead of a car parking space. And there's also a new low traffic neighborhood in Arlington Road area. Uh, yes, Islington Liverpool Road, put in a 1.1 meter line and cylinders inside the line. So I did a, a shot of that. Doesn't look very good, too close in. But sure enough, uh, Caroline Russell tweets, Quick work, the Liverpool Road bike lane is rightly being widened. Wider white line just planted today. Wands move tomorrow to provide 1.5 meter lane. Minimum width for wheels for well-being, but now inclusive of non-standard bikes and mobility scooters. Thanks to the um, environment and transport person on Islington Council. Uh, Lambeth Atlantic Road, there you can put seats on your planters. Unfortunately, there's been an account of somebody putting nails and stuff in them. Vandalism happens, but it's an ongoing struggle. On the other side, you've got people who take all the impediments out. Hopefully they can photograph the people doing these kind of acts of vandalism. Brent Harrow Road cycle lanes, uh, ones disappear at the bus stops, but general feeling seems to be it's better than what was before. Uh, and there's your stuff to read. I won't spend time on that. Uh, don't forget that consultation I told you. Just been told that there's a webinar on tackling dangerous driving in Avon and Somerset um, by Amy Ayer and Thomas. You can book that on Eventbrite um, and or else you go to Bristol Cycling Campaign website. Uh, next week I will give you notice of a very 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 special webinar which will be held and which you are all required to attend and that's basically it apart from a couple of nice photos 
uh, of subsidizing. There you go. And that's it until next week. Cool. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about behavior change, although I will uh, hopefully address Bob's point before he's even made it. So that will be my challenge. Um, but I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a storytelling. So we are at the welcome to the front line of climate action in the UK at the moment. We know this. We know where we are. We know this is happening. This is the front line. And there are lots of reasons to be cheerful that we know about. Bob recaps them every week, but to give it the big picture, we've got Active Travel England coming, we've got new mandatory design standards, highway code, pavement parking, don't forget that consultation either. And yet, as we know, this is happening. Division, hostility, marches, schemes going out you all know this this was when the daily mail starts writing about you, you know you've got problems pretty much every national newspaper in the country covered low traffic neighborhoods this weekend but it is worth remembering we've been here before this is where simon and simon from the london cycle campaign have to take a drink 2015 wolf and forests uh loads of opposition the scheme ended up going in and is now a pioneer so but, you know, this kind of patchy rollout is depending on the, lo the whims of local councils uh, is not going to get us to the kind of decarbonisation of transport that we need to hit, hit our carbon emissions targets, never mind make the kind of places that people actually want to live in. Um, but I'm not really going to talk about that, as we've covered that a lot in these sessions. I'm going to talk more about um, the bigger picture. Why is there so much opposition to low traffic neighbourhoods? when the community benefits are so great, and how do we need to tackle the kind of bigger picture? So I think there is a need for more effective approaches in some of these hot areas, but I'm not gonna share my thoughts on that tonight. I have put some links in these slides. There's lots of useful tips on how to do that more effectively. I'm gonna talk more about behavior change, which I will rename later, which is the big challenge is how do we actually mobilize people to want to walk or cycle and crucially not to drive short distances. Because my premise is that just putting in schemes is not enough. Um, so behavior change, I am gonna use the phrase a bit and there are many theories and models uh, of how it works and I'm not gonna go through them, you'll be pleased to know. But I'm gonna summarize and say that actually the evidence for how you create a mass behavior change for walking and cycling and reducing driving well, there isn't really any. The evidence around behaviour change so far is really about, well, we made this scheme, did it work? So it's about uh, individual case studies, not mass change. And also these, um, a lot of the uh, campaigns and people that are working on behaviour change strategies, they're based, as I found out, and I'm no expert, I'm, I'm sharing what I've learned here, uh, they are based largely on the public health realm. So they are largely based on how do you stop people smoking? How do you stop people eating too much, etc. And I contend that, you know, maybe they're not appropriate for trying to make a massive change in uh, a kind of societal behaviour, uh, especially at the scale we need. So in Greater Manchester alone, we need one million fewer journeys to be driven a day uh, to hit our climate targets. So, you know, Focusing on individual behaviour is not going to get there. Valid as that is for individuals. So I'm just going to share a few myths. Uh, there's a great TED talk linked out of this slide here. Basically, uh, one of the myths is, well, we just need facts. We need to edu educate people. We need to change the way they think. And you do need facts, but they're kind of like the oxygen. They're just, if you don't have the facts for why you're doing it, you shouldn't be doing it. They're just like done, assume that communicate them well but the reality of what you need on top of that are these things you need to show people that change is possible you need to show them that it's expected and you need to show them that the effect is tangible and you need to do all that really well and uh, you also need to make it easy so if we're talking about mass behavior change you're not just individual incremental a few more people cycling here and there 
by the way, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority Policy Guide told me they needed a 2000% increase in cycling. This is the kind of level we're talking about. Then look at some of these examples, you know, drink driving in the 80s and 90s, smoking in the 2000s, the move to online working during COVID. You know, what uh, made those changes happen was not um, individual focusing on individuals and, and helping them get to the point they could make a change. It was setting down, uh, setting behavioural expectations. And just to take those three points I made before, so how are we doing in terms of transport, the motor travel at the moment? Well, lockdown definitely did and has shown what uh, is possible, hasn't it? I mean, that is why this is top of everyone's agenda or many people's agenda, because everyone's gone, me, this is what happens when we take cars out of our communities. So it's been, we have shown people what is possible. Tick. Is it, what is it, let's show that it's expected. Are we doing this with um, low traffic neighbourhoods and the, and the surrounding uh, move to walking and cycling? Um, I contend that in the boroughs where this is working well, yes, we are. Um, this is some pictures from Lambeth, Claire Holland, who uh, mentioned a lot in these sessions, leading from the front, uh, really showing what's expected. And um, I think it's something that's missing from the schemes that are being pulled. Uh, in Levens, Hume in Manchester, where I live, there was a horrible three to four week tumbleweed where controversy kicked off. No, no councillor made a single public statement about, about the scheme. Um, and then the third thing is showing that the effect is tangible. And this is why we need the schemes to be in for more than five minutes. And uh, you can use data to show the change, which is really useful for those facts. But as we know, facts don't win many arguments. Better still is photos, images and people's direct experiences of real live events. And I contend that's why School Street should be the focus for a lot of campaigning right now, because the change is instant and kids who can argue with kids just before i move on though a word on facts i think that um you do need facts as i said they're like oxygen but it's the way that you talk and listen to people the way that you engage that's going to make a difference and um uh so that's what we'll talk about now so the way to what we need to communicate this is this isn't about shall we do this this is about how shall we do this and again the boroughs that are getting this right are doing exactly this a great example is bath who put this out a couple of weeks ago and it's worth just looking at this um sort of slide basically what they're saying here is uh we've got this money to we've got this problem we need to bring traffic down and increase walking and cycling we've got some money to do it here's how we're going to use data to decide where to do it here's how you're going to be involved Here's how we're going to shortlist. Here's how you're going to be involved. And it's a, it's a great example of that. Um, not shall we do it, but how shall we do it? That crucially, um, uh, I'll come on to that in a bit, it crucially does this. It treats people, creates this dynamic, which in psychology, um, talk about sort of relationships between people. You're looking for adult to adult, not this, which is parent child. And that's what in where, where these are going wrong, a lot of these schemes are triggering this kind of dynamic between people. We know what happens when children uh, are told off. They uh, don't like it. Just going back to this slide, um, I think there's a lot more that we should be doing with the criticisms that are being made of low traffic neighbourhoods. Maybe not the bonkers ones, but when you boil it down, there are two main themes. One is that these schemes are undemocratic. And I think that I've already spoken to that this is in how you communicate what's going in and where people can influence them. The second key point, though, is not being addressed, and that is that these schemes are unfair and more work needs to be done on this point. You know, that the traffic's being displaced from parts of the neighbourhood to another another part. And I'll come back to that. But more work needs to be done on that. That isn't just facts um, to say, well, it doesn't happen because we've got the fact to show it. The fact is, actually, it has happened in some places. Um, so a good example of this adult to adult relationship that we're trying to achieve um, the Climate Assembly UK that reported back uh, two weeks ago, 100, 106 members of the public given a number of weekends to uh, mull on this question, how should the country reach net zero by 2050? And crucially, they weren't asked, shall the country reach net zero? They were asked, how shall the country? 
and um, they came out with some really wide ranging recommendations that went would go far beyond what any politician would come up with quote here from one of the members saying you know it was all about being given the facts and i'm sure that helped but i think this was far more important which was that the way the assembly was conducted over a series of weekends people invested with a sense of responsibility uh, and a collective sense of it was it was up to them to find the solutions creating that adult to adult relationship so I think in summary that um, why am I saying all this is because the, I think the challenge has moved on largely from influencing and persuading politicians, big caveat, not in local boroughs and not, it hasn't moved on away from it, but it has moved on to also needing to engage and activate the general public in a way that maybe we haven't had to because we haven't had the policies and funding that we need. Now we're getting that, we need to focus on this bit as well. As uh, many of the more experienced campaigners will tell you on this call, you know, uh, ultimately we need political will in the boroughs to make things happen. But political will does ultimately come from a feeling that there is public support behind that. So the, uh, the task at hand, if you like, has moved on from not just curbs and cones, hearts and minds is what we're about. And I think to do that effectively, we need to acknowledge what we're up against. And how do we do that? Well, one way is we go, well, there are whole industries who made billions and are making billions, making and selling us things that we are going to tell people that they either need to stop doing or reduce doing. So what could we learn from those industries, given that most of them have spent a long, long time affecting techniques based on really detailed understanding of human nature and, and um, emotion and how that can be used to sell us things we don't need. Well, how would we use that to do good? And to do that, we need to understand human emotions. Uh, I'm going to talk of, through a few things, and they all stem from this chap, Edward Bernays, who's known as the father of PR, and uh, it's worth just Googling him. He's a very interesting character. And he invented something called the engineering of consent, which um, has been used for quite negative reasons to sell us stuff. My contention is let's understand it more to, for good. So a couple of examples of that, diamond rings. So in the 1920s, the beers, I think it was, wanted to invent a new thing to sell people. So they came up with the idea of the diamond ring. Diamonds aren't rare and they're not expensive, but um, you wouldn't know it. In the 20s, uh, there weren't enough people smoking. So uh, Bernays, who I've mentioned, uh, came up with the idea, well, women didn't smoke much at the time. Let's sell smoking as a feminist right. If you believe in yourself as a woman, then you will smoke. And cars. Uh, well, I think they moved on from this approach, using uh, the horse's analogy. And we know how cars are sold to us now. You know, they are liberating and protecting their status symbol. And look at this one from the BM, from BMW, this advert, you know, there are no facts, there are no graphs. That is just pure emotion selling us that car right there. And the facts are these, you know, we know that cars are killing us uh, in many, many ways. Their numbers have increased. The uh, stat I like best on that side is the average speed in Manchester, where I live, is six miles an hour for cars. So um, they should, in fact, be done for breaking the advertising code. And um, some people actually are creating adverts to set the record straight these days. So, yeah, so if we can talk about behaviour change, we need to understand that a lot of consumer decisions are driven by emotion. And I don't think there's enough of this being built into how this problem is being tackled. I don't think I'd go this far. This quote from behavioral economics describes humans in quite um, sort of de uh, derogatory way, if you like. But still, I think there's something in it. And I'm going to talk through a few um, tips, uh, sort of techniques that are used by advertisers to sell us stuff that are fundamentally important to understand about human nature. So the first one is that we are social animals. We used to live in caves. And one of the ways that we uh, could die was being separated from the group. So we have a fear of social exclusion. And um, this is used to, to sell us all sorts of stuff. Don't, you know, don't be, uh, don't be not part of the group. 
but we can use it for good. So if we're trying to help people uh, make good energy choices, best way to, to do that is to tell people that their neighbours are doing it because they don't want to be socially excluded. Um, so people might tell you they want to help save the earth, but the more effective way is to tell them what their neighbours are doing. This can also skew a lot of data, which is why probably why E.ON came up with that campaign, because people probably told them uh, because they didn't want to be socially excluded, that that's what would make them buy their energy. It's one of the reasons why the Brexit polls uh, supposedly were so out was that people on the telephone told didn't want to feel this fear of social exclusion. So they told people, well, they basically lied and said they were going to vote to remain. Online polls were different. They didn't have to say that to another person. Second point, design. Um, so how can we help people through the way that we design things, help them do things? And uh, this is a men's urinal. You want to save money, cleaning up your toilets, give men something to aim at. Fascinating. This uh, apparently saved German uh, toilets millions of pounds of money. And there are loads of loads of ways that we could design things to make it more obvious what, what you're meant to do uh, to walk rather than uh, take a car. And these things just aren't happening. Rewards, that's another key thing that human nature responds to. Great um, example from America where the uh, fines from a speed camera were not just, you're not just penalizing the drivers, they were toted up, totted up and given to those who'd obeyed the speeding limits. So those who'd obeyed the, the speed limit were rewarded. But far more effective than rewarding people, apparently, it uh, is actually the fear of losing something. This is one of the most powerful tools used. And I think it's one of the reasons where uh, what's provoking some of the anger um, because this is what happens when people sense change. They fear they're losing something. And the reason why this is so strong is that apparently, again, they've measured this, the pain from losing something to human brain is far greater than the pleasure from gaining something. And this is used to sell us stuff every minute of every day. Um, how else could we do other, Another important thing is just make it easy. The human brain is essentially lazy and we'll try to take the cheapest, easiest way, which is why we've all got Amazon Prime subscriptions that we don't need. And um, so let's make things the default uh, when it comes to uh, walking and cycling or not driving. So the pavement parking ban in England, why the hell is it taking so long to get this uh, in England? And give people fewer options. Again, it sort of doesn't make sense, does it? Well, but actually, again, our brain is too much. We just want fewer options. We don't want too many things to choose from. Google is the best put, got understood that right from the get go when they launched their homepage with nothing on it except, except a search box. Lastly, appeal to people's values, but don't mistake, don't only do that because there's all those other things at play as well and more. So I'll just give you one example. I'm just coming to the end now, but um, this was a good example of, well, how do you encourage Americans to save more? There's like so many, uh, you know, no safety net in America. They really need to save more. So this example brings together a few of these techniques. So the one is that humans have like this bi uh, present bias. So I don't want to um, do anything that's going to sort of penalize me now. So the idea here is you're committing to save in the future. And you're doing that by just putting your future pay rises into your savings. So you never actually lose anything, which avoids that loss aversion that I talked about. And the third thing they did was they made it the default that once you were enrolled in, you never got enrolled out unless you you know, actively chose to do so. And this has been really successful. And again, all the links are in these slides. You can have a look yourself. So these nudging techniques, it's important for you to know about, but there's a whole load of other stuff that needs to happen and to create this whole system change. Now, talks about behavior change, actually modern theories have moved on to propose that what we mean by behavior in humans is not just some sort of thing that's magically embedded within us. It's really social practices. And these practices are created through a combination of these three things, which is us as a human, the market in which we're operating in, so that's the kind of the rewards and the penalties, and the physical world in which we're operating in and how that's designed. 
and and the aim if we're talking about uh, changing people's behavior in relation to walking cycling driving is to facilitate a person's ability to easily put together a new type of social practice e.g not driving by bringing these three areas together at the same time and that's the crucial point at the same time and that's not what's happening with walking cycling driving and it's very different to these traditional behavior change approach where the focus is on the individual and the personal choices that they're supposed to be persuaded to make and often what you'll find is if you sit in some of the meetings that i'm in or some of you on the call will be in is that behavior change becomes a shorthand for the marketing bit have we done the behavior change bit basically means have we told people to walk or cycle yet but neglecting the design the, the rewards the penalties the whole set of things that make up these practices um, that's an example so I'm just going to leave you finish with one example of uh, smoking. So this was the, obviously this is an example of mass behavior change. We haven't eradicated it, but there's been a huge shift. And, you know, on the left there, I guess the early days of smoking changes were focused on the individual. They were focused on warning people about the health. So that's that loss aversion, banning sponsorship. So in sports, it wasn't so visible. And the market changes, so introducing higher taxes, taxes, making your insurance more expensive. And then it wasn't until that the physical world was addressed and the ban on smoking in public places came in in 2007, that the, that the thing came that triggered, that made it easy for individuals to put together the practice of not smoking. Obviously a lot of people still do, but nowhere near as many. And really interesting fact is that the ban if you remember this was only 10 years ago which i had to pinch myself because it seemed a lot longer had further unexpected consequences and i think these are interesting for our problem as well which is that pubs went from maybe this to more like this and we all do like a bit of old time boozers as well but it enabled pubs to focus more on food, more on women, more, more they became more family friendly, uh, more, had to spend more on women's toilets because more women started going to pubs and they had to make better use of outside space. But ultimately what that all ended up doing was that pubs changed to become more diverse and inclusive spaces. And so I think that example shows that, you know, enabling new social practices changed the space and thus encourage further positive social practices so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And one final aside on the smoking point is that um, reading back on this, and I've put all the links in the slides, one of the key things that delayed the smoking ban in England was that a lot of people supported it, MPs, high up doctors, but they were worried that it would displace smoking to the home. And I think this is this is a key point because actually that's what one of the justified points about low traffic neighbourhoods is that it, they will displace traffic to um, streets where more people or lower income live. And it's exactly the same with smoking. As it turned out, that didn't happen, which is the point of people who support LTNs. But it was a legitimate concern and it needs to be countered more than I think it is right now. So as, as Rachel Aldridge said, the challenge is that we need to build active travel into everyday life. And here's my little attempt to do that. So, you know, we need to design the walk to school that's obvious and easy to walk along. It needs to be open and not closed. We need signs up telling people how many kids have walked, have walked to that school. We need loads of free and safe bike parking. We need cars being clamped with massive penalties. Let's give people free bikes. Let's create seating areas where people can sit and chat uh, because that can be one of the unintended consequences of these changes is people spending more time in their local environment. Uh, the head teacher from the car free school in Cardiff talked about the unintended consequences of car free school was that the whole area became far um, more, uh, far less litter left in the area because people were more aware of their environment. So anyway, I just did that in about three seconds. But this is kind of a holistic approach that we need that we're not seeing. All those things are happening in individual departments, individual people doing them. And obviously we need to make it seem really fun. So last slide, how are we selling walking and cycling? 
right now, this is how TFGM are telling people to walk and cycle. It's about do our bit, which I just think is completely wide of the mark. And this one down the bottom, uh, why don't you try walking or cycling to school instead? Which ultimately is only going to be only work if we think that people haven't actually occurred to them to walk or cycle. And um, and I think that's we're, we're really missing the point here. Obviously, we're in a pandemic, so you know we have to be careful with the messaging. But I'm not sure that's really going to do it. I had a few minutes before this just to think about well, how would we do it? And I'm just going to leave you with a couple of pictures, and then that's me done. My chick. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I've, I've talked about similar things in the past, but not as well as you have. Has anybody got any questions for Claire on the big subject? I can see Bob's hand up. Go on, Bob. I said to give you the first question, didn't I? There you go. Okay, yes. I just wanted to say, um, first of all, what happens in local authorities and as done by Department for Transport is that you have a kind of split between uh, the real stuff, which is engineering, and then you have a kind of behaviour change stuff, which is uh, used to be leaflets and odd campaigns as a sort of bolt-on. And I always hated that difference because uh, it implied that the only real thing was engineering. Um, and, the, and the thing to do is to break that, that distinction down because the, the point about behavioural change of, of the kind that Claire's been talking about is that it's absolutely fundamental. And the two are interlinked so that if you do good engineering, you will get some change in behaviour. But you also need to have those appeals to people, those interactions with people. I talked about direct support for cycling a few weeks ago that actually assist people in making these changes. Uh, and in turn, that will lead to demand for more engineering. That was the first point I wanted to make. But you're so spot on about these things about wanting to be like other people, for example. Patrick Field always used to go on about that as an explanation for why people began cycling more uh, in Hackney as filtered permeability came in in the, in the noughties. And I always remember staying with friends in a village in Switzerland and the kids all rode bikes to school. And if a kid wasn't feeling well or her parents wanted to drive her to school, they really felt bad about it, you know, that they would seem to be mummy's girl and whatever. So it, it, it's all about kind of changing those sorts of things about what is regarded as normal. Mm. Th thanks, Bob. Yeah, be good to hear from other people too. Yep. yep. Yeah, nice one. Steve, Steve, I had a question, so I'm going to go to the team first. Steve, did you want to comment? Well, you better unmute yourself, and he's the host as well. Bloody hell, I'm shit at this, aren't I? Um, no, I can't, I can't put my hand up as the host, Claire. Can you imagine <laughs> how frustrating that is? Um, no, I mean, Claire and I talked about this, didn't we, Claire? Um, earlier in the week, last week, actually. And that was brilliant, Claire. It was absolutely, easily uh, one of the best expositions of that and putting all of this, putting behaviour change to one side and the obligatory need, particularly for transport authorities, to order a poster campaign when they need to do something far more radical and deeper, particularly with their political leaders, is fucking frustrating and it's been bugging me for about a decade or more. Um, so I'm glad you've captured it so beautifully. And all I would say is that the only bit I'd add, I'd add because you covered everything brilliantly, um, uh, is the nature of system change within all of that and what it looks like. And if you look at, uh, I mentioned to you, uh, Frank Gills at um, the University of Manchester, who looks at how systems change. 
and right now in the middle of COVID, what you've just set out there, the other bit we need to lay onto it is how fast can we make this change happen and what does the whole system change look like? Um, and that requires all of us sort of regrouping in a completely new way um, to look at something that's fiscal, that's emotional, that's infrastructural at the same time. It's incredibly exciting when you think about it from that perspective because it literally is history and we're right in the middle of it. We just can't see it. Yeah, and I should say that, you know, I'm relatively new to this and Steve's been doing this a, a lot longer than me. So he, he would have far more expertise to bring to this, um, but he just probably doesn't have the time. Um, Simon Monk has got his hand up. Sure, Simon, yeah, and then we'll hear from Phil. Yeah, I was just going to say three very quick things apart from excellent presentation. Thank you, Claire. That was really, really great. Um, I, I think the, the three things I was going to say was all of that stuff, like, you know, you see TFL and the mayor and a lot of the stuff in terms of the imagery, the approach, things like that, some of the messaging that you're talking about is being done in London, but it, it doesn't work. I don't think when you're in the teeth of a scheme that's being delivered right now on a trial basis, I think that requires a whole different set of kind of approaches when you're basically already got people shouting and comparing things to the Berlin Wall and whatever. So th I think that's the first point is it isn't a universal kind of approach. Sometimes you need to go fast and dirty with schemes that are already in. Um, second thing I think is, is political will, uh, you know, Political will comes from public support, yes, but actually as campaigners, we need to be way out in front of that. You know, political will so often for me has come from, you know, all shiny prizes or fear of, of being called out or, you know, other things. So there are emotions in political wills that run, uh, developing political will that runs far deeper than kind of how many votes did I get last time? How many votes did I get next time? How loud are the shouty people? And you can see that actually in London right now is you've got some of the leaders who are getting really hammered on public kind of the voice against them is really loud. And they're just like, yeah, whatever that don't care you'll vote for me next time um and i think it's really important as well to realize there are whole tranches of the uk where political will doesn't have to be about the vote because they're in safe seats whether that's council seats or or you know mp seats or whatever they're not going to change you know they're not going to know what you know this whole swathes of london that aren't going to suddenly vote conservative no matter what people do so i think political will is a, is a far more tricky bit than that um and, and I, yeah, I think that's just, I guess that's my two, I can't remember what third is, but yeah, thank you very much. Really, really good presentation. On your, on your first point, Simon, if I could just come back, I think um, in the slides near the beginning, I totally acknowledge that point, which is actually there is some bespoke kind of, right, we've got some control stuff's kicking off here. How do we handle it? And um, I actually curated some of the links there to, there's a lot of good material out there, including some stuff that you had written um so so yeah i totally accept that that um that there's a kind of a, a bes you know where schemes are kicking off there is actually a need for actually direct more comms experience and and how do you handle that um which is a whole nother talk <laughs> well we've booked you in for that one as well then claire <laughs> um phil benstead i saw you had you good to yeah. see you hello there you. hello there claire I, I also enjoyed that presentation now, I live in, I'm going to have to use two swear words here. The swear words are Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea. <laughs> those who don't not know those fellas, I mean, Westminster is gradually moving to more uh, a cycling-friendly attitude. Slowly, but it's moving. Good. Kensington and Chelsea, it's still antediluvian. It just will not change. Then a question I need to ask you then, regarding your imagery about, uh, I've got a big car, I'm important, I'm successful. The, the thing is, in places like, in Westminster's Chance of John's Wood, people, uh, houses, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. They would say, I don't want to ride a bike. I want to be able to drive my car on the outer circle of Regent's Park. Uh, I, my that they are a powerful people and they're listened to by the councillors uh, even though Westminster Council it could conceivably change to Labour could but not pos not probable how do you get those people who are have got a lot of money or influential articulate 
will come up the campaign and that they and they will get judicial review. They they will get a judicial review because they can do it. They've got the money, got the clout. How do you get those people on your side? Or is that impossible? Does anyone else want to uh, take that one? I have some thoughts. I'm not dodging it. I just think there might be people on the call who are actually dealing with this in their borough at the moment, and, I, and I'm not. I have some thoughts I can share. Yeah, let's say your thoughts to start with, because it's okay. a tough one. <laughs> well, I think the, the no, first point fun. is, the first point is um, that uh, you, may, you may not convince that person. And that's why what we're talking about is a whole system approach that changes um, people's behaviours, changes people's practices by making that easier for them. And um, so you, you do that. You, you don't go into that person's head and go, I'm going to change your mind. You change a lot of other things that then enables that person to change if they want to. And some of them never will. You know, before the smoking ban, um, you know, I guess not right at the point of the smoking ban, because actually a lot of people supported it when it came in. But, you know, perhaps 10 years before that, uh, you know, it would have been a front on people's rights and it's my right to smoke where I want, blah, 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 blah. And uh, things change, and that's my that's my point for looking at an example. It's like things do change. What made it, what made that change happen? Some people still feel that about smoking, but um, that it's their right to do it wherever. But most people don't feel that, do they? Yeah. One day. Simon got it. Oh, I put well, on Simon's on that. Simon, yeah. He's probably got some better ideas than me. I mean, I was just I was. I was just going to say on Westminster and KNC and Central London, we have two massively powerful levers now, really, one of which we've never had before. You know, the, the Central London is at real major risk. We're, London is at major risk of becoming, you know, what's called a donut city, where we see flight to the outer edges and, and Central London will be a ghost town, you know, because of COVID. Um, so... I think there is a really, really cogent case now to make to residents who've chosen to live in one of the most busy, iconic, you know, restaurant filled areas of London yeah. um, and have the resources to say, you know what, if you want to drive everywhere and you want everyone else to drive everywhere, your whole area of that city is screwed. Um, so I think there is a really powerful case there. There has been longer case, you know, like in five years that I've worked at LCC, we went from a huge proportion of Westminster residents owning cars and worrying about how to access their homes by their cars to the vast majority of them not owning cars. Most households in Westminster don't have a car now. And their yeah. at, at consultation over and over again is air quality. They are terrified of how much traffic is on their roads because everyone driving into central London. So there are really powerful levers. It's taking a bit of time. We're still working. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I have my hand up? Can I have a shout? Yeah, go on, Dave. Okay, well, I mean, I'm a fan of soft landings. Um, that basically, in Glasgow, we've now got the, the Transport Scotland in Scotland has made the bike hire schemes free. Um, for, and Glasgow's running until March 2021. So if you want to try it, you just march up and try it. Um, soft landings for people who want to give up their cars. All right? We've got to look at ways we can. Um, I don't know if it Adam's on, but uh, Coventry is talking about a mobility credit. Um, and we're getting the electric cars in Glasgow where you can join co-wheels for a pound and get £25 driving credit. Uh, that's all central government putting that money in, which is not happening south of the border. Uh, but I feel that if we make it easy to say, oh, well, we, we can try a bike because we there's, there's no charge for the membership, or it's just a pound. We can go and start using these bikes. Oh, it's good. It's fun um, to be able to get people to roll into it just by default. Um, you know, bringing the barriers right down so that you can try it out. There's no sort of penalty, you know, risk. Uh, and once you've tried it out and you like it, you're going to keep doing it. Um, and as Claire was saying, there's a certain inertia. Once you're doing something, um, You'll, you'll carry on doing it if it's if it's nice and it's easy. And I've just seen the comment that Boris bikes makes you feel very safe and comfortable. You would do all those things, you know, riding riding really stately as a galleon around London to make it easier, soft landing. Ricky, 
quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to go to Megan first and I'll come back to you, Ruth. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're next up, honest. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick, I promise. Um, re really good presentation. And I, I think really great in terms of how we talk to people, you know, ev everyday people in the areas where we're working. One of the things I'd really love to see is some of this stuff applied to counsellors. Um, both those who are maybe against against the schemes, um, but also I one one thing that I'm desperate to say, I was I was looking through the the list of counselors that I'm trying to work with at the moment, and the number of those um, don't don't tell any of them where I said I want them. My long term aim for them is to be a confident advocate for this stuff, and confident was the operative word because they need these same skills that you've just been talking about that campaigners need, they need to have that confidence about how, how to talk about the stuff that they are passionate about in a, in a way that makes sense to their residents, but also to their, their peers who might, might be part of the same party group and are a bit you know, on the fence or, or against it or just you know, don't quite get it. Um, I, my response to that, Megan, is that I think that is a, that's a, what I'm covering there is about public engagement and all sorts of things to think about and um, public behaviour practices as, as I'm positing that we call them. I think it's a specific session and there are people on this call who could definitely throw up loads of practical advice on how to, I mean Simon's talked about that political will, how to get it, how to enable those po politicians if they are on side to feel a bit more confident, how to tackle the ones who are like, mm. I mean, that, that for me is a fantastic ideas with beers and I wouldn't claim to have any uh, much expertise on that, but there are definitely people on this call who I know have. I, I guess my comment was there are people too. And I think a lot of the same stuff you've been talking about that loss aversion, that social norms, the talking, you know, right. values spot on. Yeah. But that is an individual, you know, they are individuals and you need probably horses for courses based on who are they, what motivates them, what do they get out of it, who are the three who are going to change the vote in your borough, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Deegan's gone a bit Dalek-y there. Um, I'll step in. Um, I think Ruth was going to go next. Thanks, Claire. Um, just cycled this afternoon in Richmond Park and unbelievably at school runtime, the number of teenage girls on bikes, absolutely phenomenal. Now what Richmond Park have done, as we all know, they closed it completely to cycling, then they've part opened it. And we were all dismayed that there are some cars there, but actually I just went through it for the first time and the way they've done it, it does mean the school run, school run can be done by bike. And it was just so joyous to see these children. And then I was at the railway next to a guy with two toddlers and I speak to them because I speak to everyone. They were age six, he was taking them to gym. Uh, I'm old enough, we've gone, we've lost, I'm afraid, the years from 2010 when we had safe routes to school with the Labour Party. The Tory party got rid of that. And we now have stars, but not everyone does it. I do think it's the children. I do think it's the schools. Mm. Um, every time I go past a school that there are a lot of children outside, I phone the school and speak to the secretary and complain, um, which I know Simon says I always complain, but you know, it does help if you actually respond to the school directly and say, this is dangerous. Um, we are lucky in some ways in Hounslow, we now have a huge cohort of cycling counselors, which is fantastic. Uh, many of them cycle, so they are seen on the road cycling. Um, sadly, yesterday a barrier was not put in because uh, protesters took the road and they put a mobility scooter in the middle so the police couldn't move them, which is really awful. I believe there's a new statement by our head of transport. But anyway, I just wanted to say I do think it's the children. I think it's bottom up. I think it's top down government and Schlapps has gone incredibly quiet having said we were going to have this cycling revolution. Mm. He's now backed off and we don't hear from him. We don't hear from Gilligan, but I think it has to be the school children and the schools and get the schools back on, uh, you know, safe routes to school schemes. Yeah, and, and my 
argument is that you know we need this kind of holistic approach and i think it's potentially easier to build that around a thing like a, like schools um, a tangible perhaps the appetite for certain things there's um so that's why i kind of chose that little example at the end to focus on um and yeah well i hope you can hear me again now we can oh. brian you can. Oh, yeah. Well, sorry about it. Yeah, no, um, I can't really see people's hands are up, um, but if anybody else has got more to contribute, I think we should just like uh, see this one out. I'm, I'm with you all the way on the schools. It's a bloody nightmare taking my kids to school at the moment. Um, I could talk about that all day, but you know, I mean, this is Shane Warren. I've had my hand yep. up. Um, just a quick observation, which is the smoking ban worked in the end, or the key argument for the smoking ban in the end was not about behavior change. And it was not about stopping people from smoking. It was about letting people smoke as much as they wanted, but limiting the places where they could smoke. And, and the key argument was that the people who didn't smoke had rights and that bear workers had rights and waitresses had rights. And the people sitting beside you in the office had rights and they had a right not to be exposed to your smoke. And you could smoke as much as you wanted, but just not in a manner that impinged on those rights. And then to bring in the kids, uh, a child walking or cycling to school, as far as I know, legally in the UK and in Ireland as well, is fulfilling an obligation placed on them by the state. You know, there's a, a legal duty for children to be schooled and to attend a place of education or be educated. And, you know, where is the duty? Where does the state recognise the duty towards the children to provide them with a safe route to school or a safe means of attending school? I just wanted to throw that one out there. Bring in the lawyers. Yeah, love it. Um, and, and it's a really good point about the, um, the smoking. Uh, uh, for this presentation, I read back over the history. And again, I put the link in the slide. There's a really good summary of, of it. And yeah, it was decided that positioning, positioning the campaign, and it was ex you know, it was a decision, it didn't just happen, but positioning in campaign as about uh, workers' rights was one of, the, one of the things that was seen to work. But also a key thing that happened was that um, at one point uh, they were going to propose a partial ban that would have meant that pubs who served food would have been, uh, had the ban, and pubs that didn't serve food would have not had the ban. And what that did was that created um, division within the sort of hospitality industry. You then want, no, 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 we don't want that. We're, we're all in for a ban because we don't want this double split playing field. Um, so in a, in a funny way, um, the, uh, they were able to create more of a sort of cross party support for it um, through uh, proposing a softer measure that ended up with a harder measure anyway. It's worth reading about the history. It's very interesting what happened. Lots to learn from it. Excellent. Steve, I think you wanted to come back at some point. It's a really quick one on kids and school, which is, I think, I think it would be a brilliant place to start because if we're thinking about social practices and a, a whole systems approach, there's nowhere where it's all more screwed up than the school run. So I, I'll never forget doing a focus group with, with parents who drive their kids to school and they're Key, their key reason for driving their kids to school was fear of traffic. You couldn't make it up. I was sat there in the room yeah. and I thought, bloody hell. Like, so coming on that one as well, sorry, Steve. Yeah. Is that with people working from home, we currently have a population of adults who would have driven the kids to school as part of the commute to work, who are now available to walk or cycle the kids to school, if we can plant the idea in their heads, that their life isn't built around their personal commute to work, but if they live within walking or cycling distance of the school and are working from home, it is a, a, you know, a credible idea that they could walk or cycle with the kids to school if we can pitch it correctly. Sorry, just one quick one for me on that, Shane. I completely agree um, because we've had a big disruption and there's no better time for change than during a big disruption. Um, but when we were looking at the campaign we were doing for Sustrans a few years ago on, on safe routes to school, um, th there was a tiny minority of parents who were commuting after doing the drop-off. The vast majority were just going to and from home. 
Um, it was actually very few. It was used as an excuse. I've got to go somewhere else afterwards, but it was actually very rare in practice. Yeah, good to know. Has that, anybody else got any more points on this one? It's been quite a good debate, so I've just let it roll. I just wanted to, um, if it's all right, uh, I think it was Karen who asked the question in the chat, which was what was my thinking with the pictures at the end of bike is best, but um, it's better by bike, but no pictures of bikes. And um, I'm glad she spotted that. Uh, so I'll just answer that one, which was, I didn't do it deliberately, but I, I wanted to end the presentation with um, a sort of trying to convey emotion how do we want to try and make people feel? Because that's what a lot of adverts do when you see them. And um, so that's what I went looking for pictures that for me did that. And I didn't deliberately not put a bike in, but I then did go, well, actually, part of what we're doing here is sort of selling a lifestyle. It's set, not selling a ch transport mode of transport. With It's about a lifestyle. And so for me, I, I wanted to test them out in the group and see, well, did that come across? You know, did it feel like, wow, yeah, this look, looks good? Or did it just be like, that's, that's a bit confusing, where's the bike? So, yeah, I was, I was trying something out. Did it yeah, work? No, I think it's good. Yeah, no, I, when I'm talking about a similar subject, I show a, a picture of someone riding a bike snow-handed in the rain, big smile. It's that kind of a emotion thing that you want to get over there and there. And Robin Williams got cyclings like flying and all, all these ones that are quite good. And, and I remember the European Cycling Federation doing a big um, campaign years ago, Stop Dangerizing Cycling. It was, a, it was terrible English, but it was the, it was the right approach because uh, most stuff we do to promote cycling is like, oh, it's so dangerous, don't go in this blind spot. And everything was working away, um, working towards putting people off rather than encouraging them to do it. So... Uh, I'm, I'm with you all the way on that. Karen said in the chat, but pictures of bikes make me happy. But I think, again, going back to like, who are we aiming at here? We're aiming at people who don't currently cycle. And dare I say it, that if we, we who already cycle may get off on pictures of bikes, but I don't think they're going to get the people that we need to get. The 2,000% increase in West Yorkshire, it's not going to come from people who like pictures of bikes, unfortunately. I think yeah. it's wheels of delight of children riding for the first time it's going to be it will remind people oh didn't hear that i think the squeals of delight of a child riding for the first time and getting it on little videos is, is what uh, gets me sound that would be another interesting creative exercise yeah the sounds you'd you'd use really great can i make a, can I make a comment yes um I've, uh, for example, done, I'm also a doctor bike, and I've done a uh, doctor bike, so people come and get the bike. And the trouble is the bike they get, um, it's such a load of rubbish that it's not, it's the best thing to do is to put in a skip. The trouble is how are you gonna get people to buy a reasonable bike? When I say a reasonable, I mean a bike which is new was about 250 pounds. If you buy a bike which is new about 150 pounds, it's just not worth using. And the trouble is it makes it hard work to ride a bike and it puts them off. How do we get over that barrier? How do we a trip it value to get a reasonable bike? Like somebody would spend a large amount of money on a car. They think it's worth it. There's value of it. Who ask them to spend a reasonable amount of money on a bike. They just can't comprehend it. How do we get that across? Come up for us all to think about that. But I'm going to bring Emma in now because I know she's been waiting for a while. Sorry if I miss you. Oh, that's okay. Thanks. No, it was just to say, um, I think somebody put it in the chat that um, the Dutch say it's it's not a lifestyle, it's just transport. And I've, I've heard the same thing in Copenhagen, you know, that people cycle because it's convenient and it's the quickest way to get there. And they cycle in the winter. I've seen lots of pictures of that. And, um, you know, they don't cycle to save the planet or even to save money. It's just the easiest, simplest way to get there. So I do think it would be nice if we got to that <laughs> stage. But yeah, I agree with that message. Lifestyle is probably the wrong word, but what I mean is... Um, no, I was just quoting what was in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I agree when it's your lifestyle, you don't even realise it's your lifestyle. It's just, 
just I meant it in that way, yeah. It's just something you do. Right. Yeah, no, sorry, I was just quoting what the person said in the chat. No, no, I, I, I'm <laughs> glad you raised it because um, I, I, I agree um, that it's not, it's not this sort of just this narrow, elite, aspirational thing. It's got to be... Yeah, basically, we don't care if they enjoy it or not, you know, if they just do it because it's practical and easy, that's absolutely fine by me. Yeah. That's why the, the what's the actress? I've forgotten already. The actress on the trike. Oh, okay. what, Olivia de Havilland? Yeah, I mean, that's why that's such a great photo. And there's also wonderful of um, Farrah Fawcett Major on her bike. You know, we've got to stop the Lycra images. We have to do more and more and more and more of normal looking cycling. That's, it's just so key yeah. because people have always said, oh no, it doesn't matter what you look like. Actually, it does because that's what people get criticized for. And if you can show women in their 80s on trikes, on bikes, that's normalizing cycling. It's my piece. Me and Steve did a bit of an um, email, Tennis Wants and Our Favourite Aspirational Cycling Pictures. Uh, mine was uh, Elvis riding uh, through Mexico with a child on the front, completely like uh, no helmet or anything. Sorry, uh, I see there's a few other hands up. Bob, did you want to come back in? Yeah, quickie, um, on Steve's comments about how you couldn't make it up, people saying, oh, you know, I drive because it's so dangerous uh, and uh, I drive because of the pollution. What you're up against is car culture, and car culture has uh, this central point that it is your personal thing. You can't be criticised about this. It's a taboo subject to actually question what motorists are doing, about the way they drive, and so on. And that's the point about ingrained culture, about car culture, car supremacism, I called it, and other things. And that is what we always have to have in the back of our minds, because however much we urge government to do things and support bottom up movements, you're always up against this thing that I have the right to drive where I want, when I want, how I want, why I want. So at some stage, I think we have to think about this like a ideological struggle. Uh, where you actually have to bring all these hidden assumptions out into the open and actually question them. And that's kind of a bit different from what we've been talking about today, but it, it will have to happen. Yep. Go I, was, on, I was just going to jump in on that and say, actually, like you take your kids to school, they're sucking in pollution from that your own car plus everyone else's you're mm. stuck in traffic you know it's a horrible experience there's a great like whenever you see kids do hands up surveys in schools the vast majority of kids secondary primary whatever they want to get to school not in a car yeah so i think there is an awful lot of messaging you can do with parents who are resistant with parents who are scared about their child and the road danger about you know what obesity and inactivity are massive massive issues for our children now like we have a generation of kids who have no roaming distance and who don't know how to climb trees um but they know how to play a video game sitting in the back of the car you know so i think i think there are alternative ways of positing this issue that can start to reach parents who are car addicted yeah i had uh, someone at tfgm like a uh, lady said that about walking their kids, their kids to school, and they're of that kind of teenage years. So it's the only time that they'll ever talk to her, because they're not <laughs> distracted for anything. So that sell it on that, sell it on your children will speak to you. They won't speak to you in the car. They definitely won't speak to you at home when the when the TV's on. Uh, but it was a great way. Sally, did you want to come in? Uh, so your face pop up. Hi. Um. Yeah. I thought that was a really, really great presentation, and I think um. I think social practice is a really interesting way of looking at it and I think it, you do have to extend it to beyond the people whose behaviour we want to change and think about campaigners, how, what are we doing, practitioners, officers, what are their practices and how do they interact with, with how counsellor, what counsellors are doing and then what people are doing. And I think it's quite, there's quite a kind of complex interaction between all of those. Um, but just in terms of um, this kind of immediate problem of the low traffic neighborhoods and the backlash and how you kind of make it a positive and a buy-in. One thing that I think we found in Newcastle is that those 
those things all do link up together. So if you can get your low traffic neighborhood in long enough, you don't need to persuade people that it's a good idea to ride a bike. Enough of them do, and then enough of them watch those people and are encouraged. And so you have that kind of um, influence of, of your peers. Uh, and then you'll always get the outlier, you know, you'll always get some people who either can't or won't. And you have to kind of, that, that's kind of how it is. You're not going to get everyone to change. And I think that the, the thing is how you persuade counsellors and officers often that it's worth hanging on in there long enough and that they will get that. And, and I don't really know the answer to that exactly. It's probably, you know, it's a long and involved process. It may be that they will fail with one and they may, they may leave it in long enough to have created a campaign which wants it back. And those people will make just as much noise as the people who are making, taking it out. And it may be that, you know, eventually we've found that here we have one low traffic neighborhood, which um, has, has come in because the campaign that was created when that particular closure was put in has put so much pressure on that it's been easier, much easier for the council to close it again. And I think hopefully this time it will stay closed. So, um, I think that thinking about practices, I think, is a really good way of thinking about it. And I think, but we have to think about how all of our practices join up and how we kind of not just think about what we're doing, but think about how do we communicate? How do we interact with, with others? How do we, so we found here as well with the low traffic neighborhoods, what's really helped is um, officers have not just said, oh, well, the people complaining are the people complaining. Sometimes there's little tweaks they can make that actually make it work better and that is had quite a positive impact and it's trickling through now that people go oh they did do that you know they are listening so um i think everybody has a kind of a different role to play but we have to think about kind of how we all how it all works together but yeah i mean definitely the kind of positive you know positive statements about it are really really important i think that's brilliant sally i'll, I'll give claire a chance to say the last word before we uh wind it up because it's been a brilliant conversation Unless she's gone. <laughs> no, I haven't gone yet. We're, yeah, just to say that, um, you know, I I, uh, I wanted to present something that, you know, shared some, some tips, but also some learning and got people thinking maybe a bit differently and don't pretend to be um, any kind of expert. So I think um, this conversation about um, kind of campaigning and tips and stuff you may remember a couple of weeks ago we had um, a conversation on here about you know whether we need to do more to help kind of campaigners um, sort of share knowledge and stuff like that and a few of us have started to have a conversation about whether we can create something um, for people to do that via so um, we've got another meeting on it this week and um, I'll bring an update maybe to or one of us will bring an update to next ideas with beers because I think some of the things that have come up here about how do we deal with counsellors and it's these are the things that we've talked about in the small group that we've got trying to think about how do we do this um these are the things that have come up as like well how we've got this knowledge in the network how do we share it more so thanks for the last word it wasn't about what i shared but it was about maybe how it goes forward <laughs>